On this episode of the Naturist Living Show, Gymnophobia. This episode of the Naturist Living Show is brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. At Bear Oaks, we offer traditional naturist values in a modern setting. Free your body, free your mind. www.bearoaks.ca So welcome to episode 14 of the Naturist Living Show. This is a bit of an anniversary because on December 11th of 2008, exactly or almost exactly one year ago, is when I launched the first episode of the Naturist Living Show. Um, there's actually 14 shows because I put uh, three episodes up in December and to really get it going. And after that, I tried to do one every month. And I was uh, at one point, I was at the end of the month until I moved to the beginning of the month, which is why we are with the number we are with now. Some people ask me whether uh, I'm nude when I record the show, and of course I am. Uh, this show is recorded and edited entirely clothes free And in fact, I'd like to uh, encourage all of you who are listening out there to maybe hit the pause button and get comfortable. If you're wearing clothes, take your clothes off. Get into the spirit of this show so you can really analyze how you're feeling as you're listening to the rationale about the fear of nudity, how we feel about ourselves and how we feel about our own body. Of course, if you're in the car, um, don't do that, obviously, certainly not if you're moving. And I guess if you're listening to this in a public place or listening on your, iP- uh, on your iPod or your MP3 as you're walking down the road um, and you're in a public place, obviously you can't do that. But if you're in your own space, if you're in a private place, uh, take a moment, get comfortable, and let's get into the spirit of things. But this is also um, the second part in a series of three shows on nudity and the human body and our discomfort with our own body as a general society. Obviously, as naturists, we're far more comfortable. But it's always interesting to look at how society is because it, it gives us a better perspective of what naturism is about and why we're doing what we're doing. In the first show, I looked at a lot of the issues about uh, nudity through the lens of the media because the media is a cultural touchstone that uh, we all have in common and that we relate to. And we looked at a couple of episodes of uh, Jerry Seinfeld, the show Seinfeld, and of another more current reality show called Dr. 90210 about plastic surgeons. Um, I said at the beginning of that show that I had enough material for three shows, and I am doing three shows. Um, this is the second one, and in this one, we're going to focus on gymnophobia, or gymnophobia, depending on whether you want to put the... Uh, uh, Greek or English uh, pronunciation behind the word. Um, it is a true phobia. It is defined. It is the fear of nudity. Um, as many of you out there probably know, gymnos, 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 um, it means nude in Greek. Uh, phobia is, is anything with phobia is a fear. So this is the fear of nudity. Could be the fear of other people's nudity. Could be the fear of your own nudity. Um, for most of society, it seems to be a little bit of both. And in fact, this is my uh, thesis here today, is I'm suggesting that our society has a built-in gymnophobia. That almost everybody suffers f- with some level of gymnophobia. Um, it is so common, it is so pervasive, and it's actually built in to our society. And So you say, well, I don't know, does that make any sense? Well... Let's take a look at what a definition of a phobia is. Um, According to the National Mental Health Association in the U.S., it's a persistent, irrational fear of certain objects or situations. So there can be uh, two different kinds of phobias, fear of specific things or objects. uh, For example, arachnophobia is fear of spiders. Or there can be a fear of embarrassment in a public setting. Uh, Those are called social phobias. And clearly, in my opinion, and I'm going to try to uh, rationalize that here, clearly I believe that uh, gymnophobia is what most people in society suffer from. And uh, that's what naturism 
to a large extent, is trying to cure. It's to help people with this irrational fear. Um, so let's start. Um, there is a, uh, I, I did a little research, and I found a psychology podcast from the uh, Texas Tech University Department of Psychology. And in it, uh, they interview a Dr. Martin Anthony, who is the professor at the Department of Psychology at Ryerson University and director of research at the Anxiety Treatment and Research Center at St. Joseph's Healthcare, which, despite this being a Texas podcast, this is actually a Toronto-based doctor. They also interview a Dr. Frank Dottilio, who is, uh, works for the Department of Psych- uh, Psychiatry at Harvard Medical School and at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. So if you, they, they, they talk a fair bit about uh, phobia, and it's an interesting uh, series, actually, on psychology as a, in terms of a podcast. So I'll put a link to it in the show notes. And um, so they define what is a phobia. Let's listen to that. A phobia is an extreme fear of an object or situation that is out of proportion to the actual danger. Phobia has to be a fear that is bothersome in some way. It interferes with the person's life or it really bothers them that they have the fear. Elements that we find that coexist is the issue of uh, being out of control, the issue of being put aside by their own reaction to the stimulus. So it's almost like once you develop a phobia, then there's almost like a phobia about the way that you react when you're in the presence of the stimulus. So after a while, it's that in and of itself is reinforcing of them. And of course, the more they avoid, the more it strengthens the fear. So there's a lot of common themes in how people define phobias. And the fact that it interferes uh, in your day-to-day um, life seems to be a fairly key thing, which would make generally phobia, uh, gymnophobia, uh, not be an issue for most people because you don't really have to deal with nudity in our world because we protect people from that because it's so dangerous. It's not dangerous. It's a fear. It's an irrational fear. So let's look at a phobia this way. If you and I were going to a tall office building, let's say 10 stories, we're going to the top floor, and uh, as you get ready to go in the elevator, I say, you know what? I'm not really comfortable with the elevator. I'm just going to walk up the stairs. Uh, I'll meet you at the top. You'd recognize probably that I have some fear of small enclosed places or something like that because it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense why I would want to take that many flights of steps. Perhaps I was trying to be healthy. But the way I described it, you would recognize I have a, a phobia, an irrational fear, a claustrophobia perhaps. And it's obviously impacting my life because in tall buildings it's hard to make do with just staircases. It takes a lot of time and a lot of energy and uh, physically we probably couldn't handle some of the taller buildings. Now if I reverse that and uh, we went to a nude beach and uh, it was a beautiful hot sunny day and there was really no reason to wear a bathing suit uh, because I mean, it's not like a bathing suit is really more comfortable. It doesn't really do anything. It doesn't keep you warm. It doesn't keep you dry. It doesn't really protect you from anything and really doesn't hide very much. But And we're on a nude beach, so it's perfectly okay. But as you go in the water, I say, you know what? I'm just going to wear a bathing suit because I'm just more comfortable with that. You know, it's a personal thing. Well, I'd be normal. Nobody would uh, really question that. People would say, well, yeah, I understand that fear because most people would recognize they have the similar fear. And that that's a phobia because it's preventing you f- from doing something which you should be very comfortable doing. And intellectually, I think most people recognize that they should be comfortable. So if that's not a definition of a phobia, I don't know what is. Of course, uh, a friend of mine who is a uh, professor of psychology explained to me that If everyone has uh, the fear, then it's no longer a phobia because it is ingrained in society. So from that standpoint, it probably does not meet the test or the definition. But just because we all suffer from a mental illness or disease to a certain extent, obviously for some it's a lot stronger than for others, doesn't mean it's not a true phobia. Particularly when, in some cases, it really prevents people from doing things. Let's take a look at a, a recent Oprah show. 
All new, Oprah's ultimate step out of your box challenge. I'm seriously freaking out right now. In your wildest dreams, would you have the guts to do this? Fall from 15,000 feet? Oh, yeah. Dabble it out on wheels, strip down, buck naked as cameras roll. This one, naked, past me, running into the ocean. Plus, oh a high flying surprise with Miss Out of the Box herself, <laughs> Oscar winner, Hillary Swank. As you heard, they challenged the women to do all kinds of things, to push the boundaries, to step out of their box, to be more comfortable with who they are. And they jumped out of airplanes, and they bungee jumped, and they rollerbladed. A roller derby, I think, actually, is what it was. But this show from November of 2009, uh, one of the most difficult things was going skinny dipping. Despite the fact that Oprah had made sure that there was not going to be anybody watching, there was a private beach, that the videotapes would be destroyed, that there was only women around, so it was women with women. One of those women actually was not able to do it because it was a bigger fear, and one of them actually said that, than any of the other things they've done. Jumping out of airplanes into a void, which is a natural reaction. I would say that makes sense. It makes sense that we have an instinct not to leap from high places into the air. That's not really a phobia. That's a natural fear. That's a survival instinct. But to not be able to take their clothes off and go for a swim in an artificial environment where it's only women, where that's even supposed to be acceptable in the textile world, in our society, because it's the same gender locker room type of situation. She still couldn't do it. How is that not a phobia? There's something that she wants to do. It's something she agreed to participate in, and she couldn't do it. I don't know how much more phobic it gets, but let's go even further. If you were willing to die rather than be nude, wouldn't that be a phobia? And for some Americans, it is. I don't know if you remember, but at the beginning of the this century, uh, around September 11th time, we had a rash also of often false anthrax scares. People would send little bags of powder to public offices. And the thing to do when you think people have been exposed to anthrax is to clear the building, get them in the parking lot, strip them of their clothes, and hose them down. And as Henry Siegelson, uh, the, he was the author of a report uh, uh, that he on the whole issue of how to decontaminate people and how you should equip people for that. He's a professor of emergency medicine at uh, Emory University in Atlanta. And as he wrote, and I quote, he said, some people would rather be dead than strip in public. They would rather risk dying. But in most of those circumstances, they, it, they, they were false alarms. But at the time, they didn't know that. And some refused to take their clothes off in front of their coworkers. They absolutely refused. Um, so they were risking death rather than being nude. That's a phobia. How could it not be a phobia? Perhaps most people in society suffer of this, from this condition at some level, probably would not risk dying, but still fear, still feel that anxiety. You know, the fear, the, the thought, just the thought of being nude with your coworkers, with your neighbors. You know, it's, isn't that the classic nightmare that people have of being nude in public while everybody's staring at them? It's not a fear of mine. I could do it. I'd be very comfortable. I don't want to offend anybody, but I'd be very comfortable because through naturism, which for many people in our world is a kind of a therapy, and it was for me as well because I had that fear when I was a teenager, uh, I've gotten over that. I've become comfortable with who I am. I've recognized that my body is what it is. It's not a anything to be ashamed of. It's not anything to be particularly proud of either. It's just part of who I am. And I have, uh, it's probably something I've always known, but emotionally, it's an emotional reaction because that's what a phobia ear is. It's something that we've learned since we we're very young. When as ch children, we were taught to hide, that would be afraid to be embarrassed. Um, you know, a lot of, I know of people who go to the bathroom and if the door lock doesn't work, they keep their foot on the door to keep it closed so people wouldn't walk in. 
I mean, so what? The door opens, people see, and what? How are they damaged? What's the problem? And you know, logically, they know that, but still, they're very afraid. That anxiety is typical of a phobia, like people who are afraid of flying. People are afraid of being seen nude or being nude in a completely irrational, illogical way, totally emotional. Uh, similarly, there's people who are very, very afraid, very uncomfortable of trying clothes on in a locker room or in a change room in a store. Really, why, why do we even need a change room? You know, if we were all comfortable as like naturists are, we would just go in, drop our pants, try on a pair of pants, put the other pair's pants back on. It wouldn't be a big issue. It might seem silly. You know, you might imagine uh, people changing and trying clothes on in the middle of the store. And it almost seems odd when you think about it. But really, logically, why not? But because everybody suffers from gymnophobia, we've built a world around this phobia so we don't have to be faced with it. So we have little change rooms, and we have little cubicles, and we have locks everywhere, and we do all kinds of things to make sure that we are not forced to deal with this irrational fear, with this anxiety. So the question, of course, comes down to how do you deal with a phobia? How do you treat a phobia? And for that, we went back to the psychology podcast from Texas Tech University. Unilaterally, exposure is the bottom line. You can't do the treatment of phobia without eventual exposure. Even Freud said, you know, in his work that eventually people had to go out and face their own anxieties. It's probably one of the easiest things to treat. People stick with it. They get over it. Certain phobias, like animal phobias, people are able to overcome in as little as a single session. For something more complex, like agoraphobia or social phobia, treatment typically takes a few months. And even after treatment, people may still struggle with occasional panic attacks or social anxiety in, in some situations. Now, isn't that funny? So the key is exposure. And pardon the pun, I'm, I didn't make them say that. That's literally what they decided to say. The key is exposure. And it's true. Of, for any phobia, treatment is about slow and gradual exposure. You cannot rationalize away a phobia because it's not rational. Just like most people can logically tell you that there's no reason why they can't be nude in front of each other. They won't come to any, to any harm. They won't be any lesser or better or worse for it. They'll just be who they are. They know that intellectually, most people. Some try to cover up this fear, this anxiety with... Uh, talk about uh, morals and, and, and privacy and, and that kind of thing. But really, when it comes right down to it and you try to have the logical argument, everybody logically understands, but the emotions are still there. And the same thing with fear of flying or anything else. When people are afraid of flying, what they do is they can talk about it all they want, but they have to gradually put them in settings and make them comfortable through treatment and exposure to their fear in small measured doses, it's almost like getting a vaccine, uh, they become better at coping with it. They are given tactics and tools and techniques to help them cope. And so naturism is the great therapy and treatment for gymnophobia. It's all about exposure, uh, which is really an ironic word here. No pun really intended, but that's what it is. And so we need to help people in our world, get over their gymnophobia by showing them that naturism is a better way, that they can be better people. So let's continue with our analysis of society's attitude towards uh, the human body and nudity by once again looking at uh, how we view the human body through the lens of the mass media. And one of the best shows I've seen on the topic was, was actually a, a true documentary it aired on March 3rd of 2009. It was on a, a series called BBC Horizon, the uh, British Broadcasting Corporation in the UK. Unfortunately, it was not available um, here in Canada, at least not in any of the channels that I had. And uh, this particular episode was titled, What's the Problem with Nudity? Which is, of course, perfect to what we're discussing here. So let's listen to the intro. There's one thing you do every day in the privacy of your home. But you'd never dream of doing in front of strangers. Get undressed. So what's stopping you? 
These eight volunteers are about to find out. They face an unforgiving 48-hour ordeal as Horizon exposes their minds and bodies to the problem of nudity. The problem of nudity. Now, that's a very interesting way of looking at it. And it's certainly consistent with what we've been talking about in this show. Um, it is a problem that we are afraid of nudity. It is a problem that we have such discomfort with ourselves. Um, and the question is why, and that's what this show is trying to understand or try to explain. It, it, it's a very well-made show. Um, it is, uh, despite the fact that they're bringing people together for these experiments, I think the experiments, while not scientific, um, are certainly a g very, very good way to illustrate the issues and to understand and look at how people feel and react very objectively. These eight volunteers are, have never been nude in public before. They certainly act that way. Of course, the fact they volunteered for this and they knew what they were volunteering for means they're probably a little bit more predisposed to being comfortable with themselves nude. But as you can see in the show, that's not true at all. And... Uh, what I love about the way they address the topic is they are very matter-of-fact. They are very scientific. They make no attempt to show or hide anything. They focus at times on genitals, on nipples. There is no embarrassment, no shame, no apology, no black squares, no pixelation. Everything is really clear. And as much as these volunteers knew what they were getting into, they expressed the same kind of fear, the same kind of phobia, the gymnophobia we've talked about. Uh, the irrational fear. They know it's irrational, but they can't help it. They have anxiety at the thought of some of these experiments they're doing. And, of course, the show goes to extreme lengths to make it even worse. I have no preconceptions. Um, quite a few fears. You know, the nudity bit and having an erection or something like that, that's, uh, that'd probably be one of my fears. I suppose there's a fear that um, people will laugh, um, but there'll be that element of ridicule um, or shock. So what they're expressing here is the fear and the anxiety they're feeling about the fact they're going to be nude with strangers, and they don't know what's going to happen. No detail has been provided to them yet, and what's coming is actually worse than their probably their worst fears because the producers have created these situations to really magnify and intensify those uh, the anxiety, the fears, the gymnophobia. Um, one of the early ones, they are uh, told to strip in front of a mirror uh, in a very open room. What they don't know is that on the other side, there's a person watching. It's a one-way mirror. And of course, they know they're being filmed doing this. So, of course, getting undressed has an additional element of discomfort uh, in our society. So they've really made it, uh, gone to them for the maximum effect. But what's interesting is the measurement of the, uh, the, the, the watcher, the person on the other side of the glass who is watching them get undressed, who also feel anxiety and discomfort, despite the fact that nobody sees them, nobody knows they're there. Um, they still feel uncomfortable watching somebody be nude. I mean, Really, this is gymnophobia. This is a phobia. How, how can you not recognize that we, or most of us in society, feel this phobia? And they go even further with some of the experiments. Uh, they have other ones where um, they have to stand in front of others and be critiqued and observed. They have other experiments where they have to paint each other's body uh, bodies. Uh, there's one where one dress person undresses the other. A lot of very interesting experiments. But if it was just that, it would just be another reality show with really quasi-scientific experiments. I mean, these experiments are done for television. They're done for the purpose of getting some interesting footage and illustrating a point. Um, but of course, they're not really scientific. There's no controls. The number of people is too small. What makes it a really interesting and true documentary is that they also try to answer these questions by interviewing scientists and by looking into existing research. And one of the big questions, of course, is why are we nude? Why is it that we are the only mammal that doesn't have fur? Presumably, based, if you believe, on evolution, uh, we lost that fur at some point. And so... Why would we lose the fur? What would be the advantage? 
As most naturists know, uh, a, it doesn't take a big drop in temperature for us to start to feel cold. Um, and so the fur would certainly have given us an advantage if we hadn't created clothing. And in the beginning, presumably, we lost a fur, but we didn't invent clothing immediately. Although some have theorized that it was the use of clothing that caused us to lose fur. But even if we invented clothing, you wouldn't automatically lose fur because you wouldn't... Just because you don't need it doesn't mean your body loses it. You lose a, uh, an adaptation or a physical ability or a characteristic in evolution because you have an advantage for not having it. And so here's their answer. It's this unique solution to keeping cool that drove the loss of our fur, according to Professor Peter Wheeler. Humans rely on whole body cooling and their combination of a naked skin and highly developed sweat glands enables them to lose heat at a rate not approached by any other mammal. Humans are the sweatiest creatures in history. Our skin contains the most sweat glands and at nearly a litre an hour produces the greatest volume of sweat of any animal. The surface of our entire body is an active cooling system. This means that a human can lose heat at a rate in excess of one kilowatt. Now, that's the amount of heat put out by a one bar electric fire. Now, that's really interesting. So we are nude without fur because of our ability to cool ourselves, or our need to cool ourselves. And, you know, there's a lot of experiments and a lot of demonstration. It's a really interesting show that way, um, showing how uh, we, in the beginning, having fur can actually keep us cooler. It keeps the sun off of us. But eventually, as the heat builds and builds, and it's generally accepted that we all evolved in the very hot environments of Africa, uh, the heat generation uh, becomes more than the fur can prevent from happening. And only sweating can really help us cool ourselves. And another thing that uh, I read about in a uh, running magazine once is that we can outrun any animal on earth, not in immediate speed, but over long distance because of this incredible ability to cool ourselves. We can run through the savanna and we can basically exhaust any animals. And that's how we used to hunt in packs, uh, in tribes, I suppose, in groups of humans. We used to basically chase and chase and chase animals. And that way we could kill and hunt much bigger animals than ourselves because you could actually exhaust an, a mastodon to the point that they would collapse and then it would just be a matter of uh, carving it up and bringing it back to the village. The other thing that gave us the advantage that they point out is we kept the hair on top of our head because there, this because we walked upright, we were able to lose most of our fur because we didn't expose as much of our body to direct sun, the noonday sun, except the top of our heads, which is why we kept hair on top of our head to provide that shade. So while it is true that clothing does provide some protection from the sun, it is only short-term protection for maximum protection from the sun. We actually need to shed everything and start to sweat. And I do find it interesting, you know, because when you sweat in a naturist environment, you don't get as nasty smelling as you do when you're sweating and you're wearing clothes. The clothes seem to trap the sweat. It doesn't evaporate at well. And the, I guess the bacteria start to work and you get smelly sweaty. But I find when I'm at the park and I'm not wearing anything, and even if I'm working hard afterwards and I get sweaty, it seems to evaporate naturally. And, and you don't get the same intense, nasty, pungent smell that you will get when people sweat in clothes and the sweat is absorbed and stays in clothes and doesn't evaporate as easily. But apparently this ability to cool has an even more interesting application in terms of our evolution. But to the scientists behind the sweating theory, going naked had an even bigger payoff for mankind, and particularly for our brains. The human brain produces something like 20 watts of heat. That doesn't sound very much, but if you put a 20 watt light bulb in a small box the size of a skull, it's soon going to overheat. One or two degrees and it starts to impair brain functioning, three and four degrees and it's usually fatal. This risk of overheating 
drastically limits the size of most animals' brains, but not ours. So there you go. We are intelligent because we're naked. <laughs> so naturism is actually a representation where we take our clothes off of our most intellectual evol evolution. We've evolved to be thinking, rationalizing, planning, inventing creatures because we're naked. I mean, so this evolution of being nude that we hide, this body that we are ashamed and embarrassed of, is actually an incredible evolution that's really unmatched in the rest of nature. And yet we're still embarrassed by it and we're still ashamed of it. I mean, it's, that's part of the problem is our ability to think. Part of the problem is how we create these complex societal rules and these complex cultural traditions and we, we overthink things and we start to put layer upon layer and one moral issue gets involved in another and we rationalize it all to the point where we mess ourselves up because we know historically we didn't have this body shame. Historically, we didn't have such a problem with nudity. We've just evolved this in recent centuries um, and it's become so ingrained as most phobias be do, it's become ingrained emotionally because whenever you, you, you teach something uh, with a strong emotional effect, particularly if it's something that, you've, that feels good, you create a conflict in the mind. And that can create a phobia. So, or, or it can create a fetish or all kinds of other issues. But you know, if it's something that you like to do and you enjoy, but then you're told that you can't do it, and you're told in an irrational way, in an emotional way that it's bad, then you develop this emotional reaction. And so it's a, it, you know, as it, all, all children love to be nude. They love to run around free. They enjoy it. And we enjoy it as adults, which is why naturism is so powerful. It is so addictive because it just feels good to be free and to lose these restrictions, these chains that have been put on us, these emotional restrictions that says we're, we're bad for feeling comfortable in our own skin and so when you're told that as a small child cover up and hide it, it creates these emotional connections because clearly it's not it's a, a logical explanation we shouldn't we're just told it's a bad thing we're a bad thing now interestingly enough in a documentary getting back to the show what's the problem with nudity on bbc there's another question We've answered why, uh, or where we theorize as to why we would be nude and we would lose our fur, and we talked about why we kept the hair on our head to protect us from the sun. But why would we keep pubic hair? And pubic hair is an interesting issue for me because I've always wondered why do we shave pubic hair? Why do we shave armpits? Why do we shave pubic areas? And in recent years, I've noticed as a trend, not just in the naturist world, but in the general world, uh, for people to shave their pubic hair or all of their body hair. Uh, we don't have that much body hair, but we male in particular do have some, but in particular shaving all of the pubic hair. And and people uh, talk about feeling the uh, feeling it's more attractive, that it's sexier. Um, but ironically, what we may make, be doing is making ourselves less attractive. Listen to this part. There was a recent study done that looked at the amount of tips that lap dancers earned on varying days of the cycle. And on high fertility days, men tipped them more generously. No one has yet worked out exactly what these fertility signals are. But Dr. Hazelton has identified one likely candidate. Women's body odors change. They become more attractive on high as compared with low fertility days of the cycle. And this discovery promises to solve another mystery about the naked human body. What pubic hair is for. One explanation is that body hair is a conduit for scent communication. So I, I personally have never been a big fan of, of complete shaving, but to each his own. It's certainly not against any rules at Bear Oaks. And uh, if, if people want to do that, and, and you know, we do... You know, we shave our faces as males. Uh, we do trim our hair. And, and there's nothing wrong with doing some of that, obviously, with pubic hair. It's part of how we make ourselves unique and how we groom ourselves. But I must admit, I've always found it odd um, to see 
women and men without any pubic hairs. It, it, it just, I don't personally find it attractive. I find it more that people start to look like children. Uh, they start to look uh, prepubescent, immature. Uh, obviously, their body is not. But that's what it's reminding me of. And it's certainly not something that I am attracted to. And, and I'm not, don't get me wrong, I'm not accusing other people who find that attractive of, of having any kind of fetish or anything like that. It's just maybe they find it neater, cleaner. I don't know. But as we can hear, the pubic hair and the body hair to a large extent is there. Uh, because we pick up signals through scents and through our senses. Now, to a large extent, we, be, we may be negating that by uh, showering so regularly uh, and, and therefore and wearing clothes. We have to shower because of what we talked about earlier, the bad smells that are created. So maybe it's not as big of an issue. Still very interesting to learn from this show why we would still have pubic hair, at least a theory, because, of course, you can't ever prove these things. So the question that remains now is when did we lose our hair? And more interestingly, when did we start to wear clothes? And the show addresses this question as well through a very interesting area by studying lice. Uh, we have three types of lice as human beings, which is unusual. Most animals only have one. We have head lice in our normal hair. We have uh, pubic lice, and presumably because there's no direct channels between the head hair and the pubic hair, this other lice evolve as a completely different type of lice, and that is transmitted sexually, obviously. And we have also clothing lice, and obviously, since the only animal that wears clothing, we are the only animal that has clothing lice. We can look at the molecular data for human head lice and clothing lice and deduce when those populations began diverging. And when we do that, we see that they diverged about 650,000 years ago. So there you go. It's a, it's a, it's a bit complicated, but it's, it, obviously if you watch the whole show, it's a lot easier to understand. But essentially, the oldest lice we have, which is specific to our species, is our head lice. And uh, every species has lice that is adapted to that animal. And then what they can do is they can date when, by looking at the genes uh, and the DNA, they can date when changes have happened. And so they can date when we developed pubic uh, lice, which would indicate, obviously not to the exact year, but we're talking millions of years, so that's what's uh, relevant, or hundreds of thousands of years. Um, so they can date when we started having pubic lice. And presumably when we had pubic lice, uh, it, it happened because we didn't have body lice, uh, because we didn't have enough hair to support it. The lice remain only in the, uh, in the head hair. And then the third kind of lice, which came even later, is the clothing lice, and obviously very specific to humans, uh, because we're the only ones with clothing. So by doing that, they determined essentially that we lost our body hair about 2 million years ago. And then we started wearing clothing about 650,000 years ago. So we spent about one and a half million years without any clothing at all, obviously survived very well. But then we probably decided or uh, to move into areas and climates where we needed protection from the elements, colder areas, which is why we started wearing furs and clothing. Um, I'm sure, though, that for most of that time, we didn't have any problems with nudity still in our bodies, and we weren't ashamed. That's only a very, very, very recent development, uh, even historically, when you look at the Middle Ages. And before that, people had no problem bathing together, uh, being nude together. They were not ashamed of their body. We're talking about a century or two only of development of this new gymnophobia of this body shame. Now, as much as I love this documentary, it is not perfect. There is one uh, particular scientist, Dr. Fessler, who talks about how uh, sexual modesty, uh, essentially uh, body shame, uh, embarrassment at being nude, is natural. Uh, and the show seems to accept this conclusion that all humans are sensitive to sexual modesty. But it's the fact that all humans are sensitive to sexual modesty 
even in largely naked cultures, that convinces Professor Fessler there's a real biological reason for it. So when I first heard this conclusion during part of the show, about halfway through, I was very disappointed. I was also a little puzzled because it didn't seem consistent with a lot of what they'd been showing us so far. It wasn't consistent with my experience as a naturist. Um, I, I don't, that, that quote, natural, unquote, modesty uh, disappears very quickly in a naturist environment. And it certainly is common out there. And, and if, I think this is an attempt to rationalize and explain gymnophobia as something natural and normal. If it's built in, if it's uh, something that's evolved, if it's this is the nature versus nurture, uh, nature being that it's it's built into who we are, which is what Professor Fessler is suggesting, versus nurture, which is something that we are taught. It's cultural, and so he and he explains he believes it exists because it's an attempt to keep us monogamous. Uh, to make a long story short, uh, his theory is that we because we develop big brains. We developed children that uh, had big heads, and it was difficult for them to pass through the birth canal, so they had to be born earlier. And it's true. When children are born, they're completely helpless. So since ch children are completely helpless, they needed as much protection as possible. And so when the male stuck around, obviously the female sticks around because she's the one that's pregnant, but when the male sticks around uh, after the child is born and while the child developed, their offspring has a greater chance of... Uh, reproducing themselves, and therefore the genes are passed on. So therefore we developed, according to Dr. Fessler, a natural built-in sexual modesty, an embarrassment in our body, a shame of our body, in order to, to force us to hide it, to prevent us from having sex uh, with other people and leaving our mate and being attracted to other people. Now, first of all, if that was true, then we wouldn't have people having affairs all the time, which we do. And uh, if that was true, since we're dressed in our society 99% of the time now because of this gymnophobia, and I would say most people are dressed in front of strangers 100% of the time because some can't even change in the locker room in front of strangers, we'd have trouble with sexual reproduction. We'd have trouble being attracted to each other. And that doesn't seem to be a problem in our society, is it? Now, the fact is the show does redeem itself later on because what they find and the research that they do and the examples that they do contradict Dr. Fessler's uh, theory. And they, while they don't admit that there's a contradiction, their later conclusion is, a conf in, is in conflict with this earlier statement. They never explain why, but they make the statements. Listen. Their attitudes and inhibitions have changed. And this is the crucial thing about our relationship with nudity. We're not born with sexual modesty, so we're free to shift the boundaries of what's acceptable and what is not. So long as everyone agrees, we can create new rules and avoid the risk of offence, just like at a nudist camp. So yes, they do introduce this... Uh theory that we have natural modesty, but the show really redeems itself at the end by making the, the conclusion, and the correct one as naturist, obviously, that this is cultural and that we can get over it. And it's not natural. Um, and, and, and they almost seem surprised when they make that statement. They almost seem surprised by how comfortable these eight strangers have become with each other. At the very end of the show, they show us a wine and cheese party that they have for all eight participants. After only 48 hours, two days, they're all standing in a room, eating, chatting, drinking wine, eating a little cheese, completely nude. And uh, you watch them as they're doing this, and it seems like any scene from any nature's park anywhere in the world, people being completely comfortable, you can tell by their body language and by the way they're interacting with each other, they're completely comfortable with themselves and being nude. And so the show is forced to come to this conclusion, fortunately, because I would have hated to see a show that comes to the conclusion that this uh, body shame is natural. It's, it's so harmful to our society and ourselves. But they do come to the conclusion you've just heard. And so for that 
reason, I still believe this is a fascinating, fascinating uh, documentary. Well worth it if you can get your hands on it and take a look at it. Um, if there are links, I'm going to do a little search, see if it's available anywhere on the internet still, because it's been almost a year since it was out. But if it is available, I will put a link in the show notes so that you can download it. So I'm going to leave the last word about this particular episode and about uh, this particular show to Professor Nina Jablonski from Penn State University, who uh, is doing a lot of research into why uh, we lost body hair and mammals who were evolving and losing body hair and sweating. And uh, I will let her say the final words. The irony of human nudity and hairlessness is that really it's the apex of human evolution. The state of nudity is the state of being human. Essentially, having a naked skin and understanding the evolution of that naked skin is understanding everything about being human. So that's it for this episode of The Nature's Living Show. This was part two of three on nudity in the human body and our, our view of it and how we deal with it. Join us next month uh, when we do the final installment, part three, and we'll be reviewing several more shows that deal with nudity in the human body and society. Thanks for listening. This episode of The Naturist Living Show was brought to you by Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park. Traditional naturist values in a modern setting. Traditional values means that naturism is more than just taking your clothes off. It is a life philosophy with physical, psychological, environmental, social, and moral benefits. Bear Oaks Family Naturist Park strives to promote those naturist values in a modern setting that provides the amenities and services that our members and visitors expect. Free your body, free your mind. Learn more at www.bearoaks.ca. Thank you.